Hey guys, how's it going? So I've got this uh, article on TeamLiquid.net. I thought I'd share with y'all. Um, did I zoom in too far? I guess so. Anyway, um, so it was by Sir Jolt and Fuse Fuse, apparently. So they got, it's called A Lesson in Dota Linguistics. And it's such a cool article. I'm going to go ahead and read it to you guys. I know I'm kind of rusty with reading, but I'm going to give it a go anyway and see how it turns out. A Lesson in Dota Linguistics. For those of you preparing to watch the International 3 who haven't yet had a chance to dig into Dota 2, there's a chance that you'll be put off by the plenitude of new terminology. I'm not sure if he spelled that. Is that a correct word? I don't know. Whatever. I'm not the editor. I'll keep on reading. <laughs> the safe lane is the short lane, while the long lane is the off lane or the suicide lane. If this seems straightforward, there are those who point out the safe lane is in fact longer than the long lane, depending on how you measure it. It's a game that has developed its own language over the years. But more than that, the gameplay of Dota itself constitutes a strange language. And every game tests 10 players' ability to argue in that language. <clears throat> when I first played Dota, I came to the same uncomfortable realization that so many of us have when we first played man what is wrong with this guy's i really need to just edit this article <laughs> i was terrible is what he was trying to say i knew that i was terrible but there was no number of guides i could consume that would lend vigor to my play normally i'd be content to sit back and say maybe i'm just not very good at competitive games that had been my experience with Brute War and StarCraft 2. But there was something else lodged at the back of my mind, almost out of reach. It took a long time to identify that feeling. This felt like something I could be good at. There was a capable portion of my mind that was trying hard to digest an enormity of data that was arriving in the wrong format. I needed some simple analog to learn from. I needed a mnemonic. Somewhere in my consideration of a mnemonic device that could encapsulate every hero and their skills, it occurred to me that I was writing an essay, but I wasn't alone. So look at that, some guy drew this, planning an introduction, picture of Juggernaut, and there's all these study books on the desk. And Presumably some kind of writing tools or potions. Or, I don't know what those are. Anyways, um, they're, they're ink containers. <laughs> Who knows? Whatever. So it's, uh, it goes on. Before you write anything, you need to have a plan. It begins with the introduction. If you're an aware reader, you can guess at the way an introduction will be written. If you know who's writing it, if you know the shape of the piece. In an essay like this, you'll want to open with your central thesis. You'll want to present things in a very particular way. If your writer is competent enough, they might be able to stint things a particular way to give the impression that they're not going to make the argument you think they are. So, and the reason he starts talking about that is because he's saying that this is a game testing your ability to argue. And that's why somebody would do something like that. So then he goes on. Before you pick anything, you need to have a plan. It begins with the draft. If you're aware enough, you can guess at the way a team will be constructed. If you know who's doing the drafting, if you know the style of the game. In a game like this, dude, I totally want to edit this so bad. Ugh. Anyways, but it's a super good article. Um, in a game like this, you want to open with things that are core to your lineup. You want to present things in a very particular way. If your captain is competent enough, they should be able to present things in a way 
in such a way as to give the opposing team the wrong impression. In Dota, as in writing, there is a lot to be said for a little misdirection. When you draft, you're not just building a team, you're building an argument. The less preparation your opposition has before they're faced with that argument, the better. We're all familiar with the way a date game of Dota plays out. For the most part, players sit in lane and hurl spells back and forth for the early game, the laning phase, and one team or another ekes out an advantage to take into the mid-game, at which point things start to lose their defined shape. Knowing how things will shake down in the laning phase as early as possible allows you to alter your draft accordingly. If there are particular arguments that will undermine your strategy, you have the opportunity to ban them. As with any argument, though, there are unorthodox movements. You could always be, oh, could always open an argument by insinuating that the person with whom you're debating hasn't any right to be there in the first place, or that his mother is a tawdry hardlet. You could start your debate by shaking hands and squaring off against the opposing team. You could slap their captain in the face and grab themselves an aegis at level one. So this whole thing about blah 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 that right. I, sure that's referring to banning the heroes because I'm I know you can't really chat uh, in all chat um, while you're drafting so um, yeah <clears throat> but of course this other part is just referring to the gameplay and what you do at the start and you know another thing maybe what he might also be saying though is maybe maybe what he meant to say I don't know is that you might like start casting spells with the opponent or try to make a first blood or whatever. I don't know. Moving on. Uh, the next section it says a verb is a doing word. I have ruined their life stealer. Of course, there's a picture of him. A feed me sign. Rather interesting. So the analogy runs deeper than debate, though. For those of us more used to working with words than with spells and skills, the landing phase is an opportunity to test your opponent's ability to build their argument. The players involved find themselves with limited vocabulary that grows over the course of their first few levels. These skills, for the most part, represent the verbs with which you can interact with the opposing team. Verbs are nice and easy. You press a key and something happens to another player. The subject-object relationship isn't too difficult to disentangle. What you end up with then is a conversation unfolding across three lanes, assuming that no one has retired to the jungle to start working on their thesis somewhere quiet. The way in which these conversations unfold depends on the heroes involved and their respective vocabularies. In the case of heroes like Lion, Shadow Shaman, or Silencer, a huge portion of your input into the conversation comes in the form of being able to cut off a part of the vocabulary your opponents have come to rely on, whether in lane or as part of their team fight. This might include something as simple as unexpectedly silencing or stunning a trained protector at the exact moment that your allies decide to make trouble for his friend on the opposite side of the map. In cases like these, it's possible to weaken their argument by revoking access to certain skills. There is no more effective way to counter the argument that a pair of heroes is making in your lane than by having a full and comprehensive understanding of the way they'll want to make their argument for the lane. Knowing their abilities inside and out gives you the advantage of knowing how to undermine them, whether that's by ensuring you're never quite inside the range of their stuns, or denying them the experience they need to get required levels, and so on. Of course, this means that if you're a beginner looking to get into Dota 2, your journey from noob Boy, the effective player is most probably going to require your t your learning 
at least the most common of Dota's 100 plus hero skills. Of course, this is a newbie saying this, so obviously this sentence could use a little work, but it's still pretty um, plausible. Okay, moving along. Given that most heroes, with the exception of outliers like the Invoker, have somewhere in the neighborhood of four skills, you're staring down the barrel of some 400 skills. Of course, you're going to spend your first few games playing with others who aren't ma making the best use of their chosen heroes' vocabularies, which will make life easier, but sooner or later, you'll need to engage in a little language acquisition. That language acquisition comes in a few different forms. For those of us who are into the esports side of things, you'll hear the names of items and players bandied around. For those who take more learn by doing approach, you'll see other players building items you can't imagine in your first few games. Long before you have the opportunity to build one in the game, you likely have some idea of what a Black King car or a Scythe Ice does. And the similarities with childhood language acquisition aren't too hard to puzzle out. As your vocabulary broadens, you'll find yourself in a position to pick holes in opposing teams' arguments. Where certain compositions have before seemed watertight, you'll begin to see that critical hero or skill that holds the team together. Once you identify that weakness, you can begin the delicate work of disentangling your opponent's arguments. While you do so, you may have to consider the utility of a hero like Rubik, whether he's on your team or with the opposition. Playing against a good Rubik is like trying to have a running debate with a man who has access to a dictaphone and a mixing desk. I actually don't know what he's talking about here. <laughs> your own points come back to haunt you, but in the context of the enemy's team, they seem twisted and larger than life. And that's very true, actually. Playing well in that context requires you to understand your own skill set, but also how well individual elements of your own abilities synergize with those available to their team. Playing against a competent silencer is an experience akin to attempting to have a political debate with a member of the opposition occasionally kicking at the cables of your microphones. The capacity to shut him, to put him down, ideally by silencing him, for the sake of poetic justice before he manages to do so, helps to unravel the other team's strategy before they can enact it. As you can see, there comes a time when simply knowing how to play the character you've chosen offers diminishing returns. There is more mileage in knowing how the characters you're interacting with function, whether friend or foe, as well as understanding the quirks of their individual skills. You're not competing with the other team nearly as much as you're attempting to build a very compelling argument with your teammates. You need to understand the points your team wants to make so that your arguments will back them up rather than undermine them. I want to just pause here and say that I've found this to be the case with a lot of players and they just can't get from s I rate people on skill level from 1 to 5 and a lot of people they just can't get from 2 to 3 it, or they can't get from 3 to 4 and, and so on from one skill level to the next just because they don't understand this uh, important uh, thing. It, it, it's not just good to help, but you have to help in the right way. Because otherwise, it's like... <laughs> you're really not helping, even though you really want to. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. An adjective... The next section. An adjective describes a noun. The silencer is mute. Oh, oh, hmm. Of course, all the above only... In case you guys don't know, well played. This is just uh, like a meme on the development forums where people say that that's all they t they put like in their chat wheel because that's that's the only thing they can say or whatever. But I think that was kind of obnoxious. I would just use like pretty much anything I can in the chat wheel. I was muted, but that was like just uh, when the mute system was actually broken. 
anyways, whatever. It's supposed to be funny. There's like these little background things, and like I don't know how that's funny with the smiley face and the feed me sign, but I don't know. It's I guess. Oh, you know, it's it's just because it's like saying, you know, ha ha ha, we beat you. I guess that's it. And so this is the same thing. I don't know. The silencer has to admit that you did well by understanding him, and that's what he was trying to talk about here. Is uh, just plain, you know, like whatever hero you like all the time, whether it's Chuggernaut or Lion or uh, Mental Spear or Dragonite. It, it, it doesn't matter who it is. If you just play that hero all the time, that's not necessarily going to help you a whole lot. It might help you to play heroes like Silencer and Rubik and so on, just so you can understand how the hero works a bit better. Anyways, so <clears throat> moving on. Of course, all the above only really. Ill only really addresses the verbs of Dota. Some of the most interesting spells in the game function in a manner far similar, far more similar to adjectives. Rubik's Null Field, for example, confers on his team the, the resistance to magic. I don't know why this guy has to use so many extra words. It reduces the efficacy of a whole selection of the verbs available to their opponents. Knowing when it's in effect to what extent and how it affects every skill in your team is a feat of mental gymnastics that gradually becomes a sixth sense. Uh, I'm not sure, sure if I believe that because you can click on the hero and see what the level of their R is like sometimes. Anyways, um, but you know, he, he does have a point. There, there are a lot of other abilities where maybe it won't show the level for sure. So go look out for that. But yeah, um, like, it, oh, that, that spell hit me for like however much damage and then so that means it's level whatever so that means by process of elimination the other ability is level whatever right so anyways that, that doesn't necessarily have to do with what he's talking about so anyways it goes on to say the crystal maidens arcane art does almost the reverse lending everyone on their team extra mana regeneration which means that opponents need to be aware that it's not really lending, it's giving it away freely. <laughs> what kind of wording is that? You need to be aware that they'll be on the receiving end of enemy spells more often. Huskar's Berserker's Blood manages to transform him from ranged hero to insufferable ranged hero. So there's that adjective, insufferable. So that's what the Berserker's Blood does there. Okay, so an adverb describes a verb. So that was actually a really short uh, section. Un Unfortunately, honestly, I feel like that is one of the best sections, but I guess he figured that was enough discussion. Um, Drow's frost arrows make me weep inconsolably. <laughs> then there are skills that act as adverbs. Reverse Gemini attack ability effectively just appends the word twice to his attacks. Similarly, the anti-mage's mana break causes his basic attacks the a victim's mana away, while Enchantress's ultimate lends a healthy amount of damage to attacks. Each of these skills is going to have impact on mm. and the way you phrase your in-game argument, determining what stance you'll take to enemy behavior. And that's before we even get onto the topic of items. On top of some 400 or so skills for you to add to your working vocabulary, You'll need to remember that you're playing against five people at once, rather than just the one, two, or three you could see early in the game. Honestly, I'm, I'm not so sure. I think Frost Arrows is an adverb, but I think uh, Anti-Mage Manor Break is actually an adjective. But whatever. Moving on. <laughs> uh, where were we? Okay. Yeah, there are 400 skills, blah, blah, blah. Then against five people at once, more than just one, two, or three. So from the pool of 400 skills, the enemy team has access to 20, give or take. Ideally, you'll know how their skills interact too, but we'll get to questions of grammar a little later on. A noun is a naming word. The Phantom Lancer is ruining my game. Nouns are a strange case. For all the other connections between Dota and language, they were the example that it took the longest to occur to me. In spite of how common nouns are in everyday speech, first I had thought that there simply wasn't a parallel. 
so many spells seem to fit the verb template that the humble noun seem to have been eclipsed. As is the way with these things, as soon as I thought of one, the rest slotted into place in short order. There are relatively few skills or items that manifest as nouns in Dota, though those that could be considered to do so without stretching too far those involved with summoning of some creature or other, Visage's ultimate, summon familiars, as well as the Invoker's Forged Spirits are certainly examples. Beyond that, the Dark Seer's Wall of Replica, Warlock's Chaotic Offering, and the Humble Manta style all allow for a player to create some new creatures to fling at opponents. Of course, I should have looked no further than Phantom Lancer, whose skill set allows for a little more than the tireless creation of additional Phantom Lancers with which to erode an opposing team. Having a decent Phantom Lancer on your team allows you to simply filibuster your way to victory. Prepositions describe the situations of a noun. They're pudges on the cliff. So I guess we're talking about like positioning and stuff. Okay, this is pretty interesting. Dota does have some skills and items that effectively function as prepositions, though there are few enough of them. There are certainly times when a skill would be more useful if it were executed from over there, or on top of something, or if the enemy were closer to me. Yeah. You can use a blink dagger or force staff to describe a position you'd rather something were in. While the skills that fit this description most closely are, of course, <clears throat> the anti-mage and queen of pain's blinks, with all their various differences, there are also sand kings, but a strike could cause mark the spot, and puck's ethereal jaunt to consider. Oh, sorry, I was yawning there. And that's before we even begin to describe Pudge's hook and Chen's test of faith, the significant of their strange combination. There are, of course, others, but you get the idea. Yeah. I love manipulating other people's prepositions. That's fun. <laughs> Grammar and syntax. That's a pretty wild-looking picture. I don't even understand what it's supposed to be of. Uh, maybe it's a, a secret shop? Oh. oh, it's a side shop, because that's where the, um, I don't know. I, I, maybe it's just a home-based shop or whatever. It doesn't make any sense to me. The realization of all of the above may not help other players as it has helped me. Right, I can only imagine. I can only speak to my own experience. The truth is that I'm not cut out for Dota. <laughs> There's an awful lot to keep in mind. I can barely remember getting dressed in the mornings. If you ask me what I ate for dinner last night, the odds are I'd only be able to answer it by having a quick look through the sink. <laughs> Atrocious through my memory might be, though my memory might be. There is some portion of my mind that manages to remember words quite well. If you were to tell anyone looking at a new game that they'll have to learn the rules behind 400 skills and 130-ish items, they'd tell you where you could shove your game. But words? Words are straightforward. You know, in reading this piece, knows tens of thousands of words. But it's not just a question of how many words you know. Rather, it's how those words are deployed in sentences and in how... Sorry. And... And all their manifold combinations. Blech. What is he saying? How those words are deployed in sentences. And how in all of their manifold combinations. What? Whatever. Deployed in sentences. And in all their manifold combinations. It makes language. This sentence doesn't make any sense to me. It's, what is he trying to say? Anyways, moving on. There's a tremendous volume of metadata attached. In isolation, any skill is an interesting curiosity. Once those skills start being stacked on top of one another, the question of whose understanding is better starts to get muddy. The ways in which skills interact with one another constitute the grammar of the game. Knowing and understanding the strange interactions between skills like the Batrider's Flaming Lasso and Pudge's Meat Hook
Okay, that there's no there's no finality to this sentence. It doesn't say anything. <laughs> Both skills should allow you to drag a player from one position on the map to another. We all know that Shadow Demon's disruption can be used to save a target as a bat rider drags them, or that the Beastmaster's roar cuts through magic immunity. But how many of us can say with any confidence whether it's possible to hook a player who is currently under the effect of a flaming lasso? <clears throat> Questions of grammar like the above don't only arise with beginners either. Earlier this year, we're fortunate enough to speak to IG Squad. One of the feelings he communicated about Dota was that it was of vital importance to fully understand what he called the minutia of the game. In explaining the team's defeat at the hands of Navi at the International 2 this time last year, Chuan described Puppy as a genius, explaining that IG hadn't been aware of one very specific change to the interaction between Naga Siren, Song of the Siren, and Tidehunter's Ravage that had cropped up somewhere in the translation from Dota to Dota 2. Navi's superior understanding of the game's arcane grammar facilitated those staggering team fights. Well, I just still won in the end, so what does it really matter? Um, <clears throat> moving on. It could have been the turning point of a match between the finalists and a competition that would determine the best in the world. And it all came down to just one of the possible interactions between two of the game's forged skills. In terms of spells intertwining, there are no means by which you might predict how things will work without simply testing the interaction. As a frustrated French teacher once shrieked at me during what was to prove a protracted oral exam on irregular verbs, sometimes there is no rule of thumb. There are elements of language for which only the for which the only effective option is to study every possible detail and attempt to memorize every aspect of what you discover. Ugh. A closing note on style and construction. Of course, for all Navi's cleverness in manipulating the semantics of IG's core argument, in the case of the International 2, IG adapted and wanted to crush the opposition. As in any other debate, you can only really go so far by picking at the poles in the way your opponent has constructed the argument. In the end, Navi found out just how swiftly a hole like that can be closed when the opposition is a team of IG's caliber. The truth is that there are very few substitutes for experience. Originality and audacity certainly have their place. As anyone who saw Alliance's mass TP to their tier 1 tower for level 1 or sad snipe to the G1 league can attest. But as in writing, the innovation and flexibility is strengthened by a firm understanding of the grammar on which the game is built. If you're bright and quick-witted, you'll go far in any language, but there's no substitute for total immersion. You can take every chance possible to sit down and read the rules governing a language's usage, but the truth is that you'll seldom find the day-to-day -day usage of a language in a book. You can pore over the Wikipedia pages for heroes and items, but until you understand how these things are deployed by people who use them every day, you can't know. You might read every detail of every spell, but without actually speaking Dota with another group of players, you soon find yourself in the same position as IG did. To a beginner, Tidehunter's Ravage offers a respectable 500, 450, sorry, 450 damage with 1,025 radius, which might seem like a great punchline. Anyone who's seen a few compelling orators knows the value of an opening with some of your best material. You and I, dear reader, are tourists. Oh, we've got a few words here and there. We can order a drink, maybe make some polite conversation, but there's still translation happening. Did I say polite? I don't know what I'm saying. I think I'm getting sleepy. We don't really measure up to native speakers. We can't exercise the same degree of artistic license, but we can watch. If we're lucky, we might even be aware to catch some of the poetry of it. Yeah, and you know, in all honesty, my English has just gone out the window. <laughs> but I'd like to think that I've gotten really good at the Dota language. Ugh. 
Okay. What is this? Oh, these are like footnotes. See, it would be nice if they'd actually had these footnotes on pages. <laughs> Instead of all at the end. Because it's just one big page that you have to scroll through that's really obnoxious. Oh well. I guess that's where it editing comes in, maybe. Whatever. Um, should have played afforded time to sit in the jungle on their own and work away on their argument in their little peace and quiet offered by the trees. I expect them to eventually appear with a very compelling argument altogether. In this context, picking up a Black King bar is like keeping a loud hailer on standby just in case. To quote the previous article explaining the change, without getting too technical, the difference between Dota and Dota 2 in this regard is that in the original game, the impact of timing for Ravage exists through the entire spell animation, and you could turn off Song and Siren while the spikes extended underneath the enemies, starting as soon as the song ends, giving them no chance to use BKP. So well, yeah, that's the end of the article, boys and girls. So, um, I don't know, it's kind of interesting. I mean, the guy's kind of a nerd, but it's kind of enjoyable, so, um... I thought it was kind of cool, and I figured I would might as well share it with whoever maybe doesn't frequent uh, Team Liquid or uh, Play Dota is where I also um, posted a link to it. And I gotta remember how to get out of full screen. There we go, that's not so hard. <laughs>